So again, a huge welcome um, to everybody here today. Um, at, for this, our second uh, webinar on what is the future for the assessment of learning through final examinations. Um, as you know, at our first webinar, we, we shared uh, perspectives um, on the final examination as an assessment method. Today, we're looking at alternatives and, and broadening out the conversation in a, in a, in a, uh, a, a little bit. Um, I'm delighted that we have some wonderful speakers here with you, which our chair uh, will be introducing uh, you to shortly. But before I hand over to my chair, um, I'd just like to say that we're going to, the format for today is we're going to look at some of the key issues that emerge at the insights we got from our first webinar. Um, we're going to particularly explore um, alternatives to the final examination using um, case studies from what's happening across the sector. And uh, proctoring came up in the first webinar, where, so we're going to have a little focus on that um, in the second half of this particular webinar. Um, the talks will be lightning talks, so the, the guest speakers know that they have uh, five minutes and um, Terry's turkey will emerge after five minutes if, the, if anybody talks over the, 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 the time that they've been allocated. And we're hoping to have a discussion both with the panel and with yourselves at the end. It's a packed schedule. So it gives me great pleasure um, to quickly hand over to our chair for the day, um, Dr. Nal Siri, who is the director of the Technological University Project for the AITLIT Consortium. And uh, Niall is also a National Forum board member. Niall, it's over to you. Sorry, I needed to unmute. Terry, thanks very much for the introduction and welcome everybody to what promises to be a very informative and interesting um, insight into the assessment discussion. Um, particularly thanks to Terry and her team for organizing this and bringing to the fore this discussion, uh, which is both timely and, and important. Uh, I suppose I'd like to start with some brief housekeeping in terms of the, the webinar. So the webinar will be recorded again. The purpose of that is to support the National Forum Insights publications on assessment. Um, we want this to be as interactive as, as possible, so we welcome uh, comments in the chat box throughout the entire seminar, we pick those up as we go. Um, and in addition to that, um, in the chat box, we will post a link to a Google Docs, which will allow us to expand and elaborate on any points of the chat that we want to um, discuss over the course of the seminar and beyond, in fact. Um, and we also invite you to participate in a number of polls that we run over the course of the event today. So I suppose um, without delaying anything, um, we might start with the first poll, um, which is really raises a, a couple of questions. Uh, one uh, question that we want is a really quick response to, which is we'd like to get a sense of your discipline area. Um, and that's important, again, just to, to get, a, get a sense of the breadth and, and uh, perspectives on activity. So if people could fill that out uh, really quickly, that would be great. Uh, the second thing is, um, on the last seminar, we had several speakers, but our final speaker, uh, Dara Ryder, from the Association of Higher Education Access and Disability, uh, really challenged us with a question regarding uh, the disability of our assessment system. And I just, if we can look at the second question, which is, what is your, your sense or... What do you think about that question um, in relation to the disability of our assessment system? Um, and if we can get a, a quick sense of that, that would be fantastic too. And I will hand over to Claire for the next session, which is the speaker's perspectives uh, on webinar one. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Niall. Um, I'm screen sharing here, so I'm, I'm just gonna move the poll slightly. Um, hopefully it's not obscuring anything on the slide here. Um, and I'll leave it there if people are still responding to that. We thought it might be useful just to revisit briefly some of the perspectives shared in the first webinar. Many of you may have been with us uh, for that session and the recordings also available if people would like to go back to that from the teachingandlearning.ie uh, website. Um, speaker perspectives, first of all, really were grouped into three themes when we listened back and we reviewed this again, partnership, balance, and the notion of ladders and walls or barriers and how we might take down some of those barriers. 
Um, so first of all, in terms of partnership, a view that the, the review and redesign of assessment would be something that we'd need to undertake um, in a team context, working across programmes rather than in isolation or just with um, particular individuals and their modules. Um, that dialogue would be essential in this process and that that needed to be not only with colleagues but with students. And also that small changes could have significant effects, whereas if we try to put large scale change in front of us, we can find that very overwhelming and our students find that overwhelming as well. So there was a consensus uh, amongst the speakers that those small changes might be more effective. But all that's based on an assumption of change and really the question only Nihe posed for us at the beginning of the webinar was whether we do need to consider change. Are we going to have a system reset back to how things were before the pandemic or are we going to build what she called a better normal? What kind of assessment blend can we construct? Maybe we're assessing too much and again speakers referred to that and um, we are over assessing most likely uh, and if we are over assessing can we construct something different and can we choose where to include exams rather than assuming an exam always has to be there. We probably need then discussion with professional bodies and other accreditation agencies and other stakeholders who again have been very accustomed to using exams as part of the admission to those professional areas of practice and expertise. The question was asked in what other settings in the 21st century are we asked to sit and write with pen and paper for a long time under very pressurised conditions and also whether this is really integral and is part of assessment integrity because we don't tend to include phrases like write with pen and paper for a long time as part of any of our learning outcomes. So that raises a real challenge to us in terms of our curriculum and assessment design and aligned to that then and whether we're really designing universally for all our students and giving choice or whether there are barriers there to how they're being assessed. It's said that changing assessment is going to take time and effort and resources, but one of the points Dara Ryder made was the accommodations we have to put in place around exams are also taking substantial time, effort and resources, so perhaps that should be channeled towards something else. So those were our, some of our speaker perspectives and I'm going to hand to Catherine to hear a little bit more about participants perspectives from webinar one. Many thanks Claire. Um, is my microphone okay now? <laughs> Had a little issue earlier. Um, in addition to uh, you know the diversity of speaker perspectives we invited everyone who participated in the last webinar um, to share their thoughts in the Google Doc and also in the chat and this is these are some of the themes that arose from the participants in that webinar. Um, and the first was um, what's listed here are things that were mentioned by you know, more than one participant, things that kind of rose as key themes. Um, and in the area of exams, there was a feeling that final exams will still have a place, but not a priority place, not as priority place as perhaps they have now. Um, closed book final exams, as mentioned by the speakers, are, were seen as an artificial, unrealistic way of assessing. Uh, remote proctoring came up quite a bit, and the notion of the fact that we're outsourcing something so integral to higher education to third parties, um, you know, outside um, technology companies, raises issues around data and authority. Um, no matter what kind of uh, proctoring we might implement, these things can be subverted and attempts to counter subversion lead to privacy infringements. Um, and then a number of people pointed out additional hurdles for students with disabilities and other marginalized students. Um, in the area of continuous informative assessment, there was a wealth of contributions, links, all kinds of things in the doc, but really uh, these uh, focused on the fact that we can assess a prior, we can assess a depth of learning, critical thinking, the application of knowledge and skills, and traces of learning over time, particularly through digital assessment, um, and continuous informative assessment enable inclusive assessment and inclusive feedback. So around this whole umbrella of reassessing assessment, um, we're talking about you know how might we move to more continuous informative assessments, recognizing that this has significant resource issues recognizing that we have to consider the total weight of continuous assessment and avoid overassessment. There is a perceived challenge of getting external examiners and professional bodies and regulators on board. Some of that work is in progress, some is yet to be done. Um, and uh, obviously it, all of this work requires program level consideration and design. Um, I will point you once again that we invite your sharing, just as this rich feedback shows, we invite your sharing today as well. There are a couple of questions in the Google Doc. Add a new heading if you'd like to add um, information about something else. The link is in the chat, um, and we invite you to contribute throughout the webinar. And I'd like to hand back to the chair, Niall, now. 
Great, uh, Claire and Catherine, thank you very much for, for those insights from the previous um, activity and previous seminar. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our lightning speakers for this part of the session. Um, and they are Dr. Brendan O'Connell, Assistant Professor in the School of English in Trinity College, Dublin. You're very welcome. Irene Hayden, Lecturer, Department of Building and Civil Engineering, Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Again, you're very welcome. Uh, Dr. Fiona O'Reardon, uh, academic developer teaching enhancement unit at Dublin City University and Rob Lowney, learning technologist teaching enhancement unit at Dublin City University. You are all very welcome um, and thank you for sharing with us your expertise uh, in this session. So I'll hand it over initially to Dr. Brendan O'Connell. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. thank you, and thank you all for, for inviting me. I'm delighted to, um, to be with you uh, today. Um, just to, to let you know a little bit about me at the moment, um, I, I teach in the School of English at, at Trinity. Um, I am currently the Director of Undergraduate Studies uh, in te Undergraduate Teaching and Learning in the School, and I've also recently taken on the role, very recently taken on the role of the School Champion for Trinity's Inclusive de Design um, Project, uh, Inclusive Curriculum design project which is ongoing at, at the moment. So I'm delighted to just share a few thoughts with you from uh, I suppose my perspective and drawing on on some of the things uh, that 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 we've thought about over the last the last year or so. The first thing I suppose has, has already been been mentioned and, and which came up in the last kind of webinar uh, is this this question that I suppose in many disciplines within the humanities, including uh, I suppose languages teaching the teaching of languages, there's going to be a continued need for examination in various contexts. But obviously, we're all here to think about how we can assess uh, differently. I suppose during the um, during the first lockdown and subsequent lockdowns, our own assessment strategy was really simply to convert our planned closed book to our exams, uh, to open book assignments. And I suppose the first thing I, I would comment on is really the relative ease with which that happened in, I'm not saying that happened in every discipline with relative ease, but in our discipline, it, it was not actually tremendously complicated uh, to do that. And in fact, I think that raised a lot of questions about why exactly we were using exams in the first place and whether we should continue uh, to do that in the, the future. Many of the, the exam questions, when we looked at them, they simply are, uh, in our discipline, exams, uh, sorry, essay style questions that lent themselves readily to an open book uh, context. And certainly we were not overly concerned about the students having the books in front of them as they wrote. In fact, uh, many colleagues felt it was, you know, it was perfectly welcome to allow students to have this opportunity to reflect. I suppose I want to comment briefly on one of the issues that came up in the last uh, webinar and that I know a number of colleagues are concerned about, which is questions about academic integrity. Um, but I suppose in, in our school and in our experience, um, this was really no more of a problem when we converted to open book uh, examinations and assessments than really it would be in, for example, those modules where the, the, the module is assessed by essay uh, or, or other forms of continuous assessment. And we also found overall that the quality of responses was actually broadly in line um, with what we expected in a normal year and that our, our results uh, at the end of the year were really around the same or maybe slightly higher uh, than they had been in, in previous um, years. I guess one thing I do want to highlight from our experience in the humanities is that there was a very broad range of approaches in terms of how long should be scheduled for uh, an open book exam. And, and initially, uh, many schools in our, in our um, faculty offered say 24 hour open book exams or 48 hour exams. In some cases, it was actually more than that. In some cases, it was, it was less than that or like 12, uh, 12 hours. Um, and I suppose there are different ways of thinking about that, but one of the unexpected advantages of the longer time frames was in relation to students who were registered with the disability services. One of the thing, things I found from engaging with, with a lot of these um, students was that in many cases, even when extra time was allowed and allocated for such students, many of them didn't actually feel the need to avail of it. They felt that, well, this 
24, 48 hours or whatever it was, was sufficient for them to do what they what they wanted to do. And they were happy to just to just do that. And I think, again, that raises the uh, questions about the um, the point that was raised about how uh, what kinds of disabilities are present in our um, assessments. But I do want to point out as well, however, that there are other problems presented by open book um, assessments, particularly those with long uh, durations, in that sometimes students get burnt out and overwhelmed uh, when you give them a, a long time to do something that previously they would have expected to do in a couple of hours. And we certainly had reports of students spending you know, all their time uh, for those few days just working on, on assignments and getting quite um, worked out worked up about it. So that brings me to one point that I just want to mention briefly, which is a question of, I suppose, assessment literacy and the importance of embedding uh, within our disciplines a kind of culture in which students understand why they're being assessed, that they don't feel that assessment is something that is being done to them and recognize that it's part of the learning process. Certainly in, in our school and some other schools, uh, colleagues have been experiment experimenting with different ways of doing this, including um, uh, under frameworks like universal design for learning, uh, allowing students to, to design their assessment or part of the assessment for their modules um, themselves. And, and while we don't have firm quanti uh, quantitative data on this yet, anecdotal evidence does suggest that uh, students do find this quite a kind of fair and reasonable way to, to approach it. Now, I, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say, say in conclusion, there are obviously many other ways of, of uh, dealing with this and uh, people have looked at things like reflective journals, blog posts, presentations, podcasts, group work, uh, etc. Just to echo that, I, I suppose, as, as was said at the start there, that this process does not happen quickly. It's, it's important to have a kind of conversation with all the stakeholders, including colleagues and students, but also the teaching and learning structures within our units and our administrative staff. So these changes are not going to happen uh, quickly. They won't all be in place by the start of the new academic year, but now is the perfect time to get the conversation going. Thank you. Brendan, thank you very much for that. And I'll hand straight over to Irene. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to share a PowerPoint. If you could tell me um, if you to see it. I should be sharing now. No, you able to see that. Yep, good sharing. Perfect. Going into presenter mode instead of to see it. Okay, so I'll get started then. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk and I, I will keep it brief and, and try to stick to the five minutes as best I can. I wanted to just uh, present a small little case study, if you like, of my experience through um, the COVID pandemic. We were in the middle of an accreditation process as it started with the professional body. So we had to revisit quite quickly and think on our feet in terms of how we, we assessed through that, the entire programme. So to, just to give you some, an idea and some background in terms of timelines, uh, to begin that process, you know, before, you know, everything went horribly wrong in nationally, internationally, we had actually received accreditation in principle from a professional body called the Chartered Institute of Architecture Technologists and had been awarded that in September 2019. So at that point, our programme has been reviewed quite thoroughly. And it, it, it is a four-year programme, which is into work placement currently, and there was a mixed method of assessments. Some modules had final exams, some were mixed modules with exam and CA or exam and project work. Some of the core modules were already 100% continuous assessment, and a few modules had practicals or labs because of the nature of the discipline and final exams combined with them. Uh, as we all know, the first lockdown hit in, in March 2020, and uh, we all had to readdress things on our feet straight away. So overnight assessment was reviewed uh, by every individual lecture and by the programme board as well. Um, and in terms of then, of, you know, we, we kind of defaulted back to certain things that we were familiar with as well as exams such as continuous assessment, project-based learning. Looking at purposeful use of technology enhanced learning, uh, for some staff, possibly the first time that they had, you know, had to look at MCQs or what they what Moodle platform can do uh, and kind of think on their feet in terms of assessment. We weren't facilitated with proctoring for lots of different reasons by May 2020. So most lecturers actually proctored their own exams. We timed them 
and they were done on a time schedule and uh, some uh, and then students were taught how to use office lens to upload handwritten things now we've, we, because we, we've got more sophisticated I suppose than now I would say the lecturers who needed to do an exam continued to do an exam but you know roughly maybe 56 percent of the previous exams had been done as an alternative at that point. So by April and May 2020, across the programme, some changes had happened. When I look at my own modules, the ones that I was leader for, I reviewed them myself at that point. So, you know, early March, mid-March, end March, we of course addressed the programme learning outcomes to double check that we were still okay. But I reviewed my own assessments. So I checked to what did I feel that they were authentic um, were they fit for purpose? And I felt that they were. Um, do they meet the module learning outcomes? A very important thing to check when you are based in our predicament. Um, what other assessments did I need to add in? So what were they missing one or two learning outcomes? And then I did an exercise, as everyone did, where I mapped uh, continuous assessment and project work right against the module learning outcome. And I have to say, I put the hand up, I did feel that definitely in some modules, I may have been over assessing inadvertently and you know it was quite eye-opening really that process to do that and then to report back and we did check with external examiners checked with you know management uh, to make sure that our changes were agreeable and we weren't working the system and uh, it seemed to be a quite common theme that a lot it got a lot of people talking uh, you know across um, the, the entire institute um, and then to go back to my timeline we ended up at obviously a kind of blended delivery um, up until say, December 2020 for that semester back online. So there was this definite shift away from some final exams uh, from that point on. And the decisions were made early on actually to do that. We had a, a virtual accreditation visit in February 2021. The same accreditation panel, the board from the CIET reviewed everything. They see the students work through the full year from including the pandemic and then that semester from December to sorry, September to December 2020. And uh, they were actually on board with it. They had no issues with any of the assessment changes that module leaders put forward and presented. It, it wasn't an issue for them at all. You know, and that's a, a testament really to the hard work and effort of every single person involved in that particular program. So it, it does put uh, the question out there. You know, moving forward, we're going through a question with you now, currently, actually. So we're going to all have to look at this and address it again, uh, you know, checking again our, our assessment choices per authentic. Are they fit for what they're supposed to do with the particular modules? Um, do they meet the module learning outcomes? Of course, very important. Are they student centred? We have time to take stock of that and reflect on it. And I know that a few people mentioned issues like that, and it certainly came up in in the last um, webinar and are the module learning outcomes over assessed? Okay, so and absolutely not. I sincerely hope not. So just to conclude, I would suggest that perhaps, um, you know, we've got to look at uh, addressing the learning outcomes to make sure that uh, they're met. Look at multiple assessments versus deeper assessment techniques. Uh, respect the module leader regarding their assessment choices. Um, we have to remember to use tools and people uh, so, you know, um, sorry, I was going on. Um, reflective practice evaluation tools, look at peer review, external exam review, professional body review, and then look at small pilots and reevaluate. Okay, thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Irene, thank you very much. Um, and again, I think you've touched on the, the issue of, you know, just bringing it to a fore and allowing us to really think deeply about our assessment but also identifying the resilience within the system to actually be able to deal with this. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and and uh, again, we all uh, have evidence of, of trying to manage technology too. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for, for, for managing that well. Um, so if I can invite Fiona and Rob now, maybe as the, the I think you're presenting together. So it'll be, I'll introduce you collectively. So maybe over to you first, Fiona. I'm actually going to pass to Rob first, but thank you, okay. Niall. <laughs> thank you, Fiona, and, and thank you, Niall, and thanks, everybody. I've just popped a little link in the chat um, if you guys would like to click on it, um, and I'm going to share my screen briefly and just take you quickly through a resource we've developed here in DCU 
to, I suppose, demystify some approaches to student partnership in, in assessment. As we know from previous work from the forum and from NSTEP and so on, that student partnership is very good for student learning and student engagement. And we in particular were interested in looking at, well, what does student partnership look like in assessment? And what are some of the practical approaches that we can get students involved in assessment, get them engaged and ultimately have a better experience? So um, we undertook this project and, and with the help of Ruth Nigolan from Hibernia College, we conducted a literature review. Uh, to kind of see what was out there uh, around practical approaches to um, student partnership. And then we developed this uh, resource for our academics. Um, and this resource, which you can look at in your own, in your own time and further detail, maps out student partnership and assessment along a continuum from low level partnership to high level partnership and low level partnership can include very low risk things to involve students in their assessment and give them a sense of agency things like negotiating a, a submission date uh, giving them choice in, in in the in the topics for their assessment or the methods or the formats for them to complete their assessments or, or giving them some sort of uh, input into negotiating elements of the assessment brief and as we move up along the continuum we see students become more engaged engaging in things like self-assessment peer assessment or a combination thereof getting involved then in in, in more detailed um uh, approaches like co-designing assessments or co-designing marking criteria and so on and um, some of our academics at DCU took this resource and implemented some um, approaches along this continuum um, and we've evaluated it and and going back to something Brendan said earlier um, uh, about believing that student partnership in assessment is, is a good thing we and certainly our experience at DCU is we know it is a good thing uh, we'll have some case studies out in the next few weeks and, and, and I encourage you to take a look at them but generally speaking in the research that we conducted all the students felt more engaged by um, one or more of these partnership approaches they felt they learned more as a result, and both they and the lecturers would like to keep doing this kind of thing um, into the future. I'm going to stop there and hand over to Fiona, who's going to just tell you a little bit about one example of, of, of how our academics have used student partnership in the past year. Thanks very much, Rob, and great to see Ruth here today as well. Um, yes, so a lot of the work that we did in the SAFCA project led to lots of other work. We have a key interest, as, as everyone I think at this point has, in academic integrity. We had it before the pivot, and obviously we are now getting um, great traction. People like to hang out with us now, which is really cool as a result of the pivot. Um, and the evidence and the research is showing us, there's no doubt about it, that involving students in any type of assessment is going to promote academic integrity. So really core to any alternative assessment. And we have one example of community of practice who are implementing interactive orals um, as an alternative assessment to exams. And it's working out really well. Uh, we've got two semesters of um, experience now and lots of data telling us that students believe it's very authentic. It's promoting academic integrity. So essentially what the interactive oral is, it's a two-way conversation based around a role play scenario. So it's preparing them for professional life or employability. Um, and it's a good way of checking in with students. It's best used if it's in a scaffolded envir assessment environment where you've kind of received a report or some piece of work already, and now you want to have a proper conversation. Some examples of the authentic conversation, one would be a French lecturer. Um, she, her authentic scenario was where she was interviewing her students as part of a radio show, and they were to discuss a book they'd read in French. Um, how we partnered students in this, they co-designed the rubrics in, in all cases or informed them. Um, they used an exemplar that was produced or a sample video recording that was produced by the lecturer and me usually in advance. And then they used the rubric to grade their lecturer and me and say which of us were performing well and not so well. And I never performed well because it was never my discipline area. But they loved calling their lecturer out. And all of this contributed to them having greater sense of assessment, shared assessment literacy, um, and um, agency in the learning. And the other thing was, it, where, where possible, we allowed them to negotiate um, or have some choice around the artifact or the scenario that they wanted to role play with their lecturer. Um, but it would have to be kind of, in, um, it would have to reflect some part of the work that they've done already as a, in, 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 the, um, in the module. So I think that's it. 
Um, so essentially any, um, any involvement from the student has a positive impact in the case. Our, our, our preliminary findings are showing us it's enhancing academic integrity. It's helped develop that shared literacy. It's engaging students by um, using authentic assessment. And I think it speaks to issues that Brendan and Irene have already shared. But thanks for your time. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Fiona and Rob, and, and thank you for sharing as well that schematic of that journey um, through that partnership um, with the students. It's, it's uh, very, very useful. Um, we will hopefully have time at the end for a further discussion on all of these um, agendas and issues that are emerging. Uh, I suppose I'd like to maybe just acknowledge the fact that, that you know, the, the initial poll that we had said that 77% of, of people on the call think that um, that assessment has disabilities. Um, so maybe just to, to acknowledge that and, and, and that's the agenda for unpacking um, these discussions as we go forward. Uh, I'd like to, to hand over to Terry now, who's going to introduce and, and, and focus on the second poll. Uh, Terry. Okay, thank you very much. At the last, at the first webinar, the issue of proctoring came up. So what we thought before we start having a conversation about proctoring, we'd just like to get a sense of your own experience uh, of proctoring. So can you, could you uh, use the poll to tell us if you've administered a remotely proctored exam, if you've actually taken a remotely proctored exam, or if you've actually done both? And I'll give you a few seconds just to, to, to get the, the answers in. And we'd like as many people as possible to participate. We've 104 participants, so it would be good to have, we have a few more to have their, their say yes. Okay, so we can see our poll is flawed. So anybody that says neither, just um, put it into put it into uh, uh, the chat as you have done. So thank you. Okay, so. I can I can tell you, Niall, that the, the, the majority are probably have not. They have not administered nor taken a proctored exam. We have some people that 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 have administered it and less people that have actually taken, uh, actually done a proctored exam itself. And a very, very small number that have done both. So we can just uh, stop the poll just now. Yes. Terry, thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I just picked up a comment in the chat box, which captured uh, quite elegantly some of the previous speakers' views, which is any involvement with students has a positive impact. I think that's a really powerful message and something that um, from, my, uh, from the very first time I, I engaged with the National Forum, the centrality of the student has always been central to every discussion that we've had. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next uh, session um, of this seminar. Um, and I, I'd like to introduce um, John Begley, who is the USI class rep, uh, third year School of Medicine, UCC. Diana Young, uh, BA Honours Psychology class rep, year two and peer mentor of the arts program in the business in, in, in DBS, SU and vice president uh, for education in Dublin Business School. Uh, Dr. Adrian Fleming, Department of, of Science, School of Science and Computing in TU Dublin, and Dr. Lisa Padden, uh, who is Project Lead University for All, uh, UCD Access and Lifelong Learning in UCD. And all of our speakers today are going to capture their experience um, as a student um, and uh, on this whole idea of proctored exams and actually doing proctored exams um, and sharing with us some of their perspectives um, from having that experience. So we will start with, with John, who's going to join us by video link. Uh, Terry, and I think you were going to maybe introduce that. Uh, so John and, and Diana will be the first speakers on this. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, John at, at, at last minute, unfortunately, was not able to come in person, but he did submit a video. He had gone out to his class um, uh, who have just completed a proctored examination. Uh, to get their feedback on the process and he's captured uh, their feedback in a, in a very short video which I'll just share. Thank you. 
Um, sorry, just one moment. Today, I hope you're enjoying this event. My name is John Begley and I'm a third year medical student who's been asked to share the experiences of his class with the Examity online proctoring system. Firstly, I'd just like to apologise for not making the event live itself due to work commitment. This is why I took the time to actually record this video and try and give you all a bit of an insight into mine and my class's general experiences with Examity. I hope you enjoy. Before I go into any specific feedback, I'd just like to give a brief summary of the experience that my class have had with Examity. So basically, we had a trial exam back in late March with the Examity system. Unfortunately though, the system was non-functional for most of our class. As a result of this, a lot of the feedback that was given by my classmates was negative. But we have to consider the fact that a lot of the negative feedback was generated towards the actual system itself, as opposed to the concept of proctor's exams, which is something that's important to keep in mind when watching this video. So basically, we decided that the best way to get feedback from our class was to ask them four relatively simple questions about their exam experience. So the first question we asked them was, how did their general experience with exams go for them? We did receive a mixed range of feedback on this, most of which was generally quite negative, but we weren't surprised because a lot of the issues did come back to entrance and exiting issues in terms of access to the exam and the site itself. A lot of our students also felt that the levels of support that were provided by the site itself just weren't up to standard, even though we did receive adequate support from our medical school. A lot of our students also felt that the site itself was too invasive and it collected too much personal information. The cameras, microphones and screen sharing put a lot of people off. And although some people did say that the site did seem well, relatively well put together, the issues were, arose because the site was relatively non-functional. Another large area of concern that came out in all of the different domains of feedback were the issue of falsely being accused of cheating and nerves around that due to actions such as head movement, eye movements, that kind of thing. So a lot of our students felt the site was generally just a bit too invasive and were worried that it would alter some of the settings on their computers. So then we decided to ask our class about the more general topic of proctored exams and how they'd feel about them going forward in future. And unlike the feedback about examity itself, the feedback on this topic was a lot more mixed. So I concluded from the feedback that a lot of our students felt actually willing to do proctored exams and understanding of proctored exam systems given the current climate, if there were adequate systems in place, which means that potentially in future, proctored exam systems could be introduced as an option for students. However, some concerns did remain about issues like recording, false accusations of cheating, a software and systems being used. Some of our students suggested open book exams and other students would have preferred a system where there was an individual invigilator that they knew, maybe a lecturer, who was actively watching them or a group of students that they were assigned to. So then we decided to ask our class if they felt that proctored exam systems affected their performance in any way. But as I said earlier, it's important to bear in mind that our class unfortunately did not have the best experience with proctored exam systems so the feedback was generally quite negative. Some of the specific issues that were pointed out were connectivity issues, and a lot of issues around false accusations of cheating, head movements, that kind of thing. A lot of our students also felt that the site was a bit too invasive, as I previously mentioned, 
and did not always feel comfortable being recorded while doing an exam. They were also wondering about the artificial intelligence algorithms that could call them out for cheating falsely. Finally, we decided to ask your class about how they felt about proctored exams in comparison to their more traditional exam experiences. Unsurprisingly, a lot of our class wanted to go back into an exam hall and felt it was preferable to the proctored exam experience. However, given my own personal opinion and a lot of our students, they did feel somewhat more comfortable sitting their exams at home if a proper system was in place and up and running that students could avail of. We have to also remember the fact that for exam hall exams, there is a lot of time wasting involved that simply isn't there with proctored exams. For example, having to go in, having to get to the venue, having to get to your seat, and all that level of organisation and stress involved on the actual day of an exam. So to conclude, I feel like personally, the best system to be in place will be a combination of proctored exams and in real life exams, and a student could have a choice if there was an up and running, adequate proctored exam system that they could avail of. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoyed my feedback. I appreciate uh, John's work commitments, um, and he couldn't join us today, but I also appreciate the time and effort that he has put into sharing with us the students' perspective on proctored exams within his class group and the amount of work that he has done. Uh, to prepare that so so thank you very much john um if i can hand over to dr adrian fleming um adrian. thanks Niall. thank you i'm going to share a very very short um, presentation of just a couple of slides Sorry, I've gone into transitions already. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on my personal experience of taking remote exams using Proctoring. Um, in 2020 and 2021, I completed two different courses where the end of course assessment involved a proctored exam online. So I suppose it's been a long time since I was a student. Um, uh, you know, in years gone by, I never had issues preparing or studying and then sitting exams, but it was always in a really formal face-to-face um, environment. Um, but I did feel approaching these exams and understanding what proctoring meant, that there was extra pressure associated with it. You know, I'm a lecturer, so I set exams, I supervise students taking face-to-face -face assessments. And, you know, in the last year, pivoting not just to teaching online, but also to online assessment, you know, some of which did include timed exams online. I did understand the pressures that existed in terms of taking exams. So, you know, having to put on the hat of a student, it added that new dimension for me. So honestly, I'm going to say it scared me just a little. So in listening to some of your other speakers, you know, talking about assessment and indeed and um, the previous speaker in terms of how it went for them, I, I felt I, I really feel some of that. So actually, there was an awful lot of learning for me. It wasn't just for me sitting the exams as a student, but also to understand the experience of the student. So um, the first exam that I sat was using Zoom to proctor the online exam. So in advance, I a set up where there were two cameras, one from my laptop facing you know, the main screen where I was going to take the exam, and then another one on my phone looking at me. So I had to log in twice. Um, there were three other students taking the exam alongside with me, um, and the exam was recorded using Zoom to observe the activity that was going on. And in advance, the Proctor asked me to sweep around my area and uh, to show him that there was nothing on my desk or under my desk. And you know, I suppose initially I thought this was, you know, I did have a feeling that it was quite invasive. It was a two hour exam, you know, and I found that I was under pressure to ensure I finished it. I think I certainly write faster than I type. I don't know, other people maybe have that same experience, but I came from a background where I always did handwrite my exams. Um, the proctor, though, the one thing they did a time check. So, you know, like you were sitting in a formal exam hall, they told you how long you'd left at different stages, which was certainly useful. The second exam, however, and that was uh, that was uh, indeed my second exam that I took. It was proctored using artificial intelligence. So this was a three hour online exam and it was invigilated by means of 
you know, a camera and screen sharing um, on my device. The one thing I'd say is that it, what really prepared me for that was I'd run a mock exam the previous week. So I went in and I logged into the system to make sure that I understood the technology and how it worked. And that gave me some comfort that I was going to be, you know, well placed to use the software and the platform um, and understand how the exam paper would look, understand how the calculator would look. And um, so for both exams, very much preparation, I felt was key to me being comfortable in that environment. You know, for the second exam, it was, you know, showing your identification. So getting the passport out. And certainly I was a little bit cautious on that. So um, the provider worked through it with me in terms of what that meant. Um, but I can certainly see concerns that people have associated with showing identification. Um, I didn't have to show my credit card or anything. So um, certainly I think that would have been maybe a step that I would have had to explore further if, if that happened. The, the organizations that I took the exams with, I have to say the one thing that they did was make sure that actually how well it ran very smoothly because they very much prepared us, all of us students in advance. So the key really was that preparation for me and um, making sure that the environment in which I was taking the exam was a really safe and quiet environment. And indeed, my family understood there was no interruptions to happen on those Tuesday evenings and nobody was allowed to use broadband for fear my technology went down. And um, so they were they were well warned on it. How did I feel about the exams in this way? I suppose I was conscious that someone was looking at me or someone was observing. And indeed, at one stage, I pressed control on my laptop and this red flashing screen appeared. And I'd love to look back on the video to see the expression on my face, because I can imagine, you know, if anybody was to examine it, say this girl is definitely not trying to cheat um, because I got such a fright. But it said, if this happens 175 times more, we're reporting you. So I, I, I felt a little bit secure then, you know. Um, but immediately following each exam, I tell you that the one thing I, I, I remember feeling was I struggled to remember all aspects of the exam paper because I didn't have a tangible exam paper to take away or to download. And if somebody asked me what questions came up, I certainly will tell you, I don't really remember all of them because of the feeling of you know, the pressure during the exam. So unlike other exams, I suppose I was unable nearly to do a post-mortem, which maybe is a good thing as well. So based on my experience of proctoring, um, you know, I can certainly see the discomfort and the challenges that present for students, but I can also see for some examinations, it possibly um, a critical one to ensure the integrity of the exam. So I think it has its place, um, but I think it is to be considered. I think preparation is key, you know, not just the technical, but also, you know, from the emotional side, I think it's important that we address that. But I also think it's important that we look to see, is it the right assessment in order to you know, understand how we meet those learning outcomes? So to finish off today, I suppose, well, after completing the exams and coupled with assignments, I did well in them. So uh, that was certainly a bonus for me. Um, but my learning was not just for me taking the exams because I wanted you know, to complete certain modules. It was also for me to understand, you know, to be a student again in this really technology driven world. Thanks, Niall. Thank you very much for that. And it's, it's quite useful um, to, to have those perspectives, particularly around um, you know, that experience and, and that emotive experience, as well as the pragmatics of, of just being able to manage a proctored exam online. So thank you very much. That, that was very, very useful. Uh, I'll hand over to, to Dr. Lisa Padden now, if you if, uh, would like to, to take the virtual stage. Sure. Thanks very much. I'm going to share my screen, but I have very few, uh, very few slides. Um, so I'm going to take you back uh, 18 months to our uh, previous world where this was our exam hall in the RDS. I'm sure it's very familiar to lots of people who are on this call where we would have had two and a half thousand students in every sitting four times a day, six days a week. Um, and we had also an alternative exam location on campus in Belfield in UCD. So that's where our students with reasonable accommodations would sit their exams. Um, but in recent years, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of students who were applying for temporary exam supports on the basis of exam anxiety so that they could sit their exams on campus rather than going to this large exam hall in the RDS. 
Um, and we had gotten to the point where for some programs, students, there were more students in the program on campus in the alternative location than there were in the RDS. So there were obviously issues in terms of this particular exam format before COVID. But then we switched online and we thought, great, you know, that's going to eliminate this particular barrier. But unfortunately, some of those barriers came with us into the online uh, format. So in terms of online exams, I suppose it's one of the most common things that happened. In the so for some students, they went, they had assignments, as Brendan described, switching from the, the timed exam, traditional exam to an assignment. But for others, it switched directly to an online exam instead. And I suppose are online exams inclusive? Well, the first thing we have to do is ask our students whether or not they're inclusive. And it's been brilliant to hear the student perspective today as well. Um, and when we spoke to our students, the issues that they reported were, first of all, a lack of clarity in terms of what is an online exam. Is it a timed online exam? It was called lots of different things. It's a live exam, it's a synchronous exam, it's a take home exam, it's an open book exam. And the expectations of what that meant for the student really weren't clear. So as Brendan talked about this issue actually. So students felt if they were doing it at home, then what was expected of them was to produce an assignment in the same way they would have produced for continuous assessment throughout the semester. When they knew if they went into an exam, they had two hours and it's a very different piece of material that they would produce. So there was a real lack of clarity for some students in terms of what was expected of them. Proctoring obviously was an issue. So particularly in the first exam session that we saw online, we did have some colleagues who proctored the exams themselves over Zoom. So lots of students felt uncomfortable in terms of privacy and um, being uncomfortable. And even the idea that their own lecturer was the invigilator in the exam was making students feel uncomfortable. So, um, and we know with proctoring software, there are lots of different issues which have been mentioned already um, in terms of how accessible it is in terms of how it reacts to students with certain disabilities and behaviors. Um, so there are definitely issues with proctoring and connectivity was a real uh, source of stress for students where they had to do a live online exam and didn't have a reliable broadband connection. Um, and the environment that they were in, because we know that the idyllic image that I showed you of the person with the perfectly clean desk and the coffee cup is not the uh, environment that a lot of our students are in. They're in shared space where they didn't have privacy and they you know, really didn't have a comfortable um, environment to do an exam in. So how do we make assessment inclusive or make the alternatives work? Well, Universal Design for Learning says we should be supporting diversity of assessment. So we have a diverse group of students and that means the, the assessment that we offer students should be diverse. We can offer choice and you know, Dr. Geraldine O'Neill has done a huge amount of work around choice of assessment. Um, and how we can make that work for students as well. And authenticity, and I was delighted to see one of the previous speakers talk about authenticity and how important that is. And I loved her checklist um, for that type of assessment as well. So how do we plan for success? So when we run the Universal Design for Learning Digital Badge, we've had hundreds of people who've made changes to their assessment. And sometimes people introduce a diverse or a new method of assessment moving away from traditional assessment. And they're a bit disappointed in terms of maybe with choice, students are still sticking with the traditional assessment method. But really what can work is having just one more choice for students. So we're not overwhelming students with lots of um, new methods of assessment, which has been the case for the past 18 months when we've all had to change. Um, but really just offering one additional choice, scaffolding the skills. So where you're asking a student to do something different, that you actually support them to develop the skills to do that. So if it's creating a video that you're giving the students the skills they need to create the video. Um, and even John spoke about um, having the opportunity to practice with the proctoring software, which didn't work for lots of the students. So giving the students a chance to practice, a chance to develop the skills that they need. And it's really the students assessment literacy as well. Um, my final point really is around students as partners, which has been spoken about um, lots, which is fantastic, but bringing students into the discussion around how they're going to be assessed and why they're being assessed in a particular way can have a really positive impact, particularly where you're introducing diversity or choice of assessment. So that you're really, um, I suppose, making the students central in terms of what you're doing with assessment. 
And I know John talked about some students wanting to go back to the exam environment, but my big post COVID wish is that we never ever go back to the RDS and never ever have two and a half thousand students sitting together doing those exams again and that we look at this diversity and choice and we take this as a real opportunity now to look at our alternatives for how we assess students so thanks very much Lisa thanks very much uh, for that and, and I think that photo certainly sparked some emotive responses from people on the that have experienced that uh, that venue um, and I think your your summation of all of the issues around validity reliability um, of assessment constructs um, is well, it was well summated, but also concluded with a very strong message again, which is, it's not only the preparation, it's also the consultation with students and, and the students being a real central partner in valid and reliable and authentic assessment constructs. So uh, I, I really welcome that and thank you very, very much for that. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to maybe open the floor initially if there are any questions, but I would like to, to bring in Diana Young. Uh, Diana was part of our, our earlier panel uh, representing the students with John, but Diana, you haven't had a chance to, to maybe to speak yet. So I'd love to hear um, your views on, on this idea of proctoring and maybe some of the considerations that need to be taken into account from a student's perspective. Thank you very much, Niall. Um, well, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Diana. Um, I was the 2020-2021 VP for Education in my students' union in DBS. So I actually got the opportunity to work alongside the um, examinations office of my college to kind of set up and to help um, get running up of the proctoring system for students during the exams. They originally, our school did a kind of a trial run in January for post-grad students. And that kind of went um, relatively smoothly. Only thing or only feedback that we got was just that students needed to be more familiar with the entire um, online system of the proctoring system, because um, we all know exams are quite stressful already. So adding another component of it being online is, um, extra stressful. Um, and then moving forward, we started doing the proctoring exams, setting up for the end of semester exams, the end of term exams for um, some of the students. Um, and one thing that came up was the word proctoring in itself. Um, the word proctoring scared a lot of students. Um, just be, number one being it's a not, not a word that we're all familiar with at all and it's something new. So we kind of ended up using the word invigilating to kind of ease the students more into the concept of proctoring and the whole experience. So I think one thing to note is just perhaps the way we introduce it to students if we are doing proctoring um, for exams. Um, another thing I would mention is that just from the experience of like getting to work in the background of how to start it up for students and stuff, it, it was really, really important to ha have the ability to call for additional resources and outsourcing um, other systems. Um, like John mentioned, having adequate systems in place to support students, not just prior to the exam to prepare them, but also during the exam when if something does, um, something bad happens, say if it's connection or anything of that matter, not being able to submit exam papers online also, that um, has become an issue also. And then as well as not just before, during, but also after to kind of ensure that students are kind of, um, I, what, I'm not sure the exact word to kind of help students um, round up afterwards and see how how they thought the exam was after the, the whole experience of going through um, proctoring. So that was really important and that required, I would say, a lot of um, reassurance, not just um, for the students, but for the lectures too, so that both, all parties were familiar and understood how the experience was going to plan out. Um, and I also actually personally, I've had the opportunity to actually undertake a external proctoring exam. And I would say it's it was quite different in that for every student that was taking an exam, there was a specific proctoring person that would 
be looking. So throughout your whole three hour exam, there was one person on the other end of the screen that would be just looking at you while you're doing the exam. So um, it, it wasn't necessarily a online system that was trying to track your eye movements. It was an actual person who was keeping an eye on you throughout the whole exam. Um, also with that, at the beginning, we had to kind of um, bring, I would have to bring my computer and show the top of my table, um, the bottom of my table, the front of my table, and I would also have to go up to a mirror um, and show my computer in the mirror just to show that there wasn't anything on my computer that was perhaps helping me cheat. Um, I'd also have to show the different walls, the four walls and the ceiling and the floor, and my back would have to kind of face the wall just like how it is now. So I think that having to include that, I think it is a very good practice to ensure that you have a good um, environment for um, having exams, but also brings about how some students may not have the opportunity or have the privilege to be in a space that is exam conducive for them. Um, and also it brings about some students not being having or not having um, technology devices that have cameras. Um, sometimes they're on a desktop that may not use a camera and that would call for students to have to go out and buy a camera for the exam and then be familiar. So it, all, it also, I think just to reiterate and to um, kind of finish off what I'm about to say is just that um, proctoring I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. And it's it's great that we have different options um, for examination purposes, but it definitely brings about a, an added on stress and pressure. And for us to kind of um, eliminate that, it's to ensure that we have resources and supports for students and lectures for both parties um, so that we can ensure the experience is as smooth as possible. Excellent, Diana. Thank you very much for that. And um, Terry, I almost kept everything to time. So my apologies to everybody for running a little bit over. Um, if I can hand over to Terry, maybe just to, to um, um, maybe just look at the next steps. But before I do, I'd like to just thank all of our speakers and our participants online. Uh, to, this was a really informative session and, and a pleasure to be involved with. So thank you very much. Terry. Thank you, Emilia Nile, and, uh, and, and thanks to everybody. And there's lots of things happening in the chat. I know that this conversation could go on and on and um, we will be producing a forum insight so please do continue to contribute uh, to the google docs and, and have your perspectives um, and share your perspectives there and um, if we if you just go and um, we have a, another just to let you know we have another webinar coming up uh, on the 10th of june Catherine, do you quickly want to, to do 10 seconds on what we're going to be talking about yeah, five seconds. Um, we already have a guide on developing enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning. We're redeveloping it. It's an opportunity for you to join that conversation. We'd appreciate it. Thank you, Emilia. Um, can I just thank Niall as chair? Can I thank all of our speakers um, very much and you as participants for joining us? Um, and I look forward to seeing you on the 10th of June for our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.